The Matrix is one of the greatest films ever made, hitting $460 million in just box office sales alone, and The Matrix was an instant hit. And after two decades, its relevancy continues to stand strong, with terms coined from the movies such as The Matrix and The Red Pool becoming widely adopted in modern culture. And yet even more interestingly is that The Matrix is perhaps one of the most beautifully prophetic and meaningful movies ever created in history. So what is it about this film that made it so culturally important? How could this movie continue to be so relevant after 20 years? What was the movie tapping into? Well, this brings us on to the bedroom of a depressed, pasty software engineer, a nighttime hacker called Neo, who is slumped over in his trash-filled room, with the bleak film colouring resembling his nihilistic, empty, dull existence that Neo lives in. At the start of The Matrix, Neo is a nihilistic man. His corporate life and monotonous desk job makes Neo feel that his actions don't have any effect on reality. Small details in the film make this even clearer, with Neo's flat being numbered 101, a direct reference to George Orwell's book 1984. In Orwell's book, Room 101 was a torture room, where people would be shown their greatest fears in order to mold them in the state's ideal image. And Neo's life is lived inside room 101, where he is tortured by the routine and can't find any meaning in his life. So he seeks to find these answers through his double life as a hacker, but comes up empty every time. Whatever he does while locked inside the matrix has no meaning. But one day this starts to change, when he wakes up to find a strange message on his monitor, with the message telling him that the quote matrix has him and that he must follow the white rabbit. It seems as though this could just be another hacker getting back at Neo. This could all just be a prank. But then, the last thing the computer writes is knock knock Neo, just before somebody does exactly that on his door. And when Neo opens the door, he finds it's a group of people led by a man who wants to buy illicit information held on a storage device. Neo lets out a sigh of relief. This is business as usual. But after the purchase is complete, the group invites him out to the club. And right as he's about to refuse, Neo sees a white rabbit tattoo on the shoulder of one of the women. Realizing that this tattoo is part of the instruction sent by him on the computer, he accepts the invitation, knowing deep down that something is up. The decision to follow the white rabbit is the first of many decisions in Neo's rejection of the Matrix, but he doesn't quite know this yet. And so when arriving at the club, Neo is approached by a woman named Trinity, who cryptically warns him of impending danger. Neo recognizes her name as a fellow computer hacker. However, she says that was all a long time ago. Trinity then talks to Neo about his general dissatisfaction with life, as she knows that Neo is aimless and tormented by a lack of meaning in his life. She knows that nihilism has sucked his soul, so she promises him that there will be an answer. Cut to the next scene and we see Neo waking up late for work and proceeding to get chewed out by his boss. But in the back of Neo's mind are questions. Was following the white rabbit just a dream? Who was Trinity? All while Neo continues his droney hollowed out existence, living like human cattle in an artificial box with artificial lighting, trapped inside a spiritual cage with all the other droogs. The crushing weight of his sterile existence makes Neo even more curious about the white rabbit. It's a glimpse of something different different. And just as Neo continues to stay stuck behind his cubicle, he is then struck by a call from a man named Morpheus. They're coming for you, Neo, and I don't know what they're going to who alerts him that the danger Trinity was telling Neo about is real, and that Neo is being followed by agents. In a tense scene, Neo briefly evades some agents who have been looking for him, but Neo's mind is the only thing holding him back. And Neo is actually successful in escaping the agents. He's finally taking that call to adventure. He's choosing to take his life into his own hands. This is the start of Neo breaking free from his cage. But then he comes up against his biggest challenge, as Morpheus tells Neo that the only way he can escape the agents is to walk across the ledge. But his programmed mind just can't overcome this obstacle. He doesn't believe in himself or his abilities. He's been programmed to be comfortable. He's never been near real danger. So his strength, his mind and ability is hampered, causing him to refuse that call to adventure. And by refusing the call, this represents Neo refusing to tackle his fear. He knows he'll be successful if he overcomes his fear, and yet his weak, anxious mind is his biggest failure. His nihilism is what keeps him trapped in the matrix, and so Neo fails to succeed, resulting in him being escorted to an interrogation room. At first Neo believes that he's being prosecuted by regular government workers, but when Neo demands to be given his rights, they seal his mouth shut, as if it was done by magic. They then implant a mechanical tracking bug into his stomach, meaning that Neo will now always be tracked in the matrix. He's an outlier, and outliers are the biggest threat to their society. And then just like that, Neo is back in his bed again seeming like this was all just a dream. And yet somehow, Neo is immediately called again by Morpheus, who gets Trinity and some other crew members to pick him up. Before Neo meets Morpheus, Trinity removes the bug that is tracking him, proving to Neo that this wasn't a dream. From here, Neo goes on to meet his mentor, Morpheus, who's living inside an abandoned building. Morpheus confirms all of Neo's suspicions, telling him that his whole life is a lie, and that he was born a slave to the Matrix. 
This was why he was so demasculated, becoming just another corporate drone. It was all by design. However, Morpheus then offers Neo a choice, the decision on whether to remain blissfully ignorant or learn the true nature of the Matrix. Similar to our own reality, nobody can really be told what the Matrix is. One has to experience it and find out for themselves. So Morpheus then opens up his palms, revealing the notorious red and blue pills in his separate hands. In his left hand lies the blue pill, Neo's ticket to blissful ignorance. If he takes this pill, Neo will simply wake back up in his bed, believing in the nihilistic system that has brainwashed him, going back to his lonely, miserable, atomized existence, all while remaining ignorant to the true nature of the world. And on the other hand, sits the red pill. Taking this pill will grant Neo access to the Matrix, allowing him to see the world for what it truly is, as nasty as it may be. This decision is the crucial point of Neo's story, and marks the first phase of Neo's hero's journey. The hero's journey is one of the oldest tales of mankind. It's a narrative structure that ranges from all kinds of stories. Stories. From Star Wars to the Bible, the term was coined by author Joseph Campbell. He describes this as being a deeply ingrained part of the human psyche that allows humans to push through walls and do the impossible in pursuit of meaning. In the real world, the hero's journey is our path towards self-improvement and overcoming our neuroticism, anxiety, fears, and laziness. Which is why right now we're seeing this whole new wave of self-improvement, serving as a counterbalance to the nihilism that's embedded so deeply in modern society. But this isn't a modern thing. In fact, many forms of Buddhism gave a similar path to enlightenment, along with so many other religions. The hero's journey is a process that's been taken by all of mankind. It's every step out of your comfort zone that brings you further towards truth. It's every action that you take towards self-improvement which brings you closer to unlocking meaning in your life. And it's one of the key things that the Matrix tries to show. We see this clearly when Neo takes the red pill and the world begins to melt around him as he soon wakes up in a nightmare situation. Upon opening his eyes in the real world, Neo almost drowns trying to remove all the cables that are attached to him in a pot. Once he catches his breath and takes a look around, Neo sees the true reality of the world, a human factory farm. As far as the eye can see, there lies identical pods attached to enormous constructs, all of them containing other humans being harvested for their energy. When a robot suddenly sees that Neo has managed to escape his sedation, he is quickly discarded and thrown down a trash chute towards a pit filled with water. Luckily before drowning, Neo is picked up by the claw of a ship and is subsequently rehabilitated by Morpheus and his crew. When being operated on, Neo questions why his eyes hurt. Along with his extreme muscle atrophy, Morpheus explains the reason. Neo is in a full-on breakdown because he has never actually experienced any kind of bodily autonomy. Once Neo is brought to stable condition, he is plugged into a chair and enters the Matrix along with Morpheus, because Morpheus needs to show Neo the true reality of the Matrix. At first, Neo is in disbelief that he's inside a computer program, but Morpheus questions him on if this is actually so hard to believe. He explains that if what you can feel, smell, taste and see, then what constitutes as real is simply electric signals being interpreted by your brain. After this explanation, Morpheus reveals that the outside world is in an even bleaker scenario than the one inside their home base. He explains that after losing control of artificial intelligence, humanity decided to create a nuclear winter, believing that a lack of energy from the sun will eliminate the machines. After the nukes, the world became a wasteland, run entirely by machines, while humanity was trapped in a dream world. This dream world is the Matrix, a simulation of humanity's golden age. It is all encompassing and never stops for the people inside it, where they live their whole lives believing that the Matrix is real. And if this wasn't heavy enough, Morpheus then springs it onto Neo that he believes that Neo is the reincarnation of a man with the power to change anything in the Matrix. He is the one. If you've been following my videos, I'm sure you know how suspicious I am of mainstream media. Oftentimes, mainstream media can be the biggest impediment to understanding the truth and keeping you stuck in our society's matrix. Which is why I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News shows you how breaking news is being covered across the political spectrum. They do this by gathering news from 50,000 sources around the world and puts all related articles in one place so you can easily compare coverage. By doing this, Ground News allows you to see the story behind the story. Using data-driven analytics, they look at things such as political bias, reliability, and ownership of news outlets. I mean, for example, check out the story about 1,300 channel migrants crossing the English channel on one day. Not only can I see that there are 31 sources reporting on this, but I can also quickly identify which sources have a political bias, according to the ratings from independent news monitoring organizations. And what's interesting about this story is that it's mostly been covered by right-leaning news outlets, all with varying degrees of factuality. With Ground News, I can also check out the ownership of each of the media companies, seeing if they're controlled by government 
governments, media conglomerates, or if they're independent news outlets. And this data is invaluable if you want to find the truth behind each news story. So go to ground news forward slash moon, or click the link in the description below or the pinned comment to try ground news for free. Or go subscribe to them to get unlimited access and support a small team of media outsiders working to make the news more transparent. Initially not taking things very well, Neo panics at his newfound enlightenment. He is realizing that the entire world around him, all his friends, memories, icons, dreams are all warped for the benefit of an elite minority. It's as though the Matrix was a warning, a warning about the path modernity is taking us, where technology has infested every aspect of daily life to a point that we've attached our own psyches into the hands of a few. You see, in our age of overconsumption and mass production, the powerful must maintain constant relevance through advertising and media. By doing this, multinationals always assure continuous demand to drive continuous profits. Instead of just manufacturing a particular product, companies need to manufacture the structure, the personality, the culture of the universal public. And Big Tech serves as the perfect vessel to do this. Every day of your life, Big Tech delivers you into an alternative reality, playing on your emotions, depression, fear, anxiety, hunger, lust, laughter, acting directly on your sensorium. The content you are constantly watching every hour of every day of every year is not a vision but a manual manufactured data stream that can be sanitized to impose cultural values that generate immense wealth. Little do we realize that every day we are chipping away our autonomy to an all-pervasive drug that delivers whatever message those dealing the drug wish it to be, providing a fertile ground for fostering technocracy. Which is why in the Matrix movie, this is symbolized by AI using human consciousness to fuel their ever-expanding empire. Neo realizes the challenge he is up against. He has to mentally and physically overcome the entire system he lived in to find true meaning, to save the entire human population. However, Neo's fears soon start to dissipate once he begins practicing and learning the inner workings of the Matrix. Back inside the program, Morpheus introduces Neo to a combat simulation inside of a dojo. This is a sparring program, similar to the programmed reality of the Matrix. It has the same basic rules, rules like gravity. What you must learn is that these rules are no different than the rules of a computer system. Some of them can be bent, others can be broken. Using a computer algorithm, Neo is able to completely understand the intricacies of Kung Fu, despite having never done so before. So Neo and Morpheus begin fighting. At the start, Morpheus is dominating. He seems unstoppable, he's flying across the room. And so when Morpheus asks why Neo lost, Neo explains that Morpheus is just too fast. But he counters this by saying that the fighting ability has nothing to do with their muscles. Cluing Neo in, Morpheus implies that Neo doesn't even need to breathe in air when inside the Matrix. So upon hearing this, Neo is able to overtake Morpheus during the second fight. He understands understands that the whole game is mental. If he can overcome the mental barriers inside of his mind, he can win anything. And by doing this, he stuns the whole crew watching the ordeal. This is all part of the trials and tribulations that Campbell identified in the hero's journey. It's the mental game that serves as the greatest barrier to success. This is the step that Campbell describes as the training and tribulations in his work. This step happens once the hero has entered into the unknown and serves as their introduction into the new world. For Neo, this is quite literal. The skills he will need are taught to him after he first exits the Matrix and goes back inside to train with Morpheus. Neo's teachings also bring Neo closer to the truth. The more he learns about the real world and the Matrix that he lived in, the more he experiences both of them and the further he is pushed towards the truth. Afterwards, Morpheus introduces Neo to another program inside the Matrix, one that holds everything that is expected in a real city, ranging from buildings to cars and simulated people. Morpheus explains that the Matrix is their enemy, but most people are not ready to be unplugged from it, as they are too dependent on the system. While listening, Neo's eyes are caught by a striking woman in a red dress. When she gets behind Neo, the woman suddenly changes into an agent, pointing a gun at him. Morpheus then reveals that these agents are in fact sentient computer programs, fully capable of manipulating the Matrix at will. It turns out that everyone who has fought one of these agents was killed, but Morpheus, believing that Neo is the one, states that the agents will never be as strong or as fast as he can be. This dream world of the Matrix is a reflection towards fears of consumerism. You see, all these films in the late 90s were particularly concerned with this, as they saw their society become more and more focused on products and commodities. But nowadays, these fears are even more prevalent. The vessel of big tech dominates everyday life in a way that we've never seen before where human values have been chopped up and commodified for a profit, where our opinions, our values, our culture, our thoughts are all controlled by technology that has saturated everything. And the numbers show that this is increasingly leading us towards nihilism. Just look around you. The atomization, the loneliness, the depression, the anxiousness. Just as Neo's life in the Matrix made him nihilistic, to find meaning we must continue our own journey. And the nature of the Matrix strikes a resemblance to the concept
concept known as the habitus. The habitus is a sociological theory that tells us that from a young age, the social convention and rules that people follow are imprinted onto your personality. These conventions aren't just habitual, but instead influence people's ways of thinking and how they see the world. And once you become part of the habitus, your actions perpetuate the cycle for other people. The habitus can be viewed much like the rules of a game. Seemingly illogical things are taken for granted and enshrined as rules. If you didn't know the rules of golf, for example, the sport would just look ridiculous. Why not just pick up the ball and put it in the hole? But knowing the rules of golf means that you see this in an entirely different way. Of course, the rules of golf exist for a reason, otherwise it wouldn't be an actual game. But the habitus has no real purpose by itself. It exists as a manifestation of the environment you grew up in. So then who controls the rules and conventions that easily influence our thoughts? When you start to ask this question about your own life, you then start to see that once you break free of the constraints placed on you, that you can finally see the world as it truly is. And the matrix is the allegory for this. It exists as a prison that surrounds you entirely, dictating what you see, what you value, and what actions you take. But none of this is actually real. Once these conventions, once these values, once these rules are tainted too much, the cracks start to show. And in the matrix, the cracks show when Neo breaks free. This is Neo's journey, breaking free from the constraints of falsehood. It's only through his self-improvement and search for the truth that he can finally find meaning. It's during the time of Neo's training in the Matrix that we're introduced to the character of Cypher. From the very first conversation, Cypher complains that he should have just taken that blue pill and begins questioning the credibility of Neo's journey altogether. We then transition to the reveal of Cypher's endgame while he's dining in a restaurant inside of the Matrix, being joined by Agent Smith. Willing to sell out his whole crew, Cypher requests to be put back inside the Matrix. Of course, not without benefits. In return, he wants to be a rich, famous actor who doesn't remember anything about the real world. Here, Cypher's entire character is summarized as he states that line, ignorance is bliss. Meanwhile, Neo, Morpheus, and some other members of the crew enter the Matrix to meet an important figure called the Oracle. Upon arrival, Neo sees a group of children who are all doing seemingly impossible things. A few are manipulating objects like bubbles and blocks using their minds, and one child even manages to bend a spoon right in front of Neo. Neo takes an interest in the child, who explains that trying to bend the spoon is impossible. One has to realize that there is no spoon. They have to use their mind to overcome impossible obstacles. Once Neo hears this, he looks at the spoon and is able to easily bend it with his mind, just before he's quickly called off to see the oracle. This spoon bending scene is important, as it establishes the way out of the matrix. As you start to realize that everything in your life is determined by your mindset, your life really begins to change. And the change of mindset isn't only an internal change, but also an external one. The way you see the world actually changes it around you. In an abstract sense, we all create our own realities through our experiences. The world is only made up of the data that our senses give us, and it's up to us to fill in the rest. In the movie, this is made literally Neo can bend the spoon because he knows and accepts the truth that it's simply a figment of the Matrix, and in doing so, this puts him forward on his hero's journey. But because Neo hasn't fully accepted his journey, or fully understood the fact that he is the chosen one, the Oracle doesn't have good news for him, as she states that he really isn't the one. And once Neo is down receiving this bad news, Neo then gets a case of deja vu after watching a black cat repeat its movements. As soon as he says this, this indicates to the crew that there has been a glitch in the Matrix. It turns out that this whole visit was just a trap set up with the help of Cypher, and things start to go downhill from here, as Morpheus is then caught by Agent Smith, and the rest of the group flees to a nearby garage. As it's revealed that Cypher has backstabbed all of them, he then goes on to kill many of his crew, but is stopped right before he can kill the chosen one, Neo. This too is part of the hero's journey. Campbell shows that one of the key steps in your hero's journey is facing someone who wants to bring you back to where you started, and in the Matrix, Cypher represents this. He's the guys you know who want to bring you down, he's the other crab in the bucket. People don't want you to succeed, they don't want you to escape the matrix surrounding you, because if you do, it shines a bad light on them. They know their flaws, they know their mindset is weak. Cypher's failed sabotage demonstrates the futility of the desire to go back to ignorance, and this is true for both our reality and the matrix. Once the truth is uncovered, there's no going back. Which brings us on to one of the most interesting scenes in the movie, a dialogue between Morpheus and Agent Smith. Two equals and opposite sides of an extensive conflict between man and AI. Smith equates humanity to a virus, one that spreads exponentially while devouring all the resources in their way. And from the perspective of a machine, he isn't entirely wrong. Smith then clears his subordinates from the room and further levels with Morpheus. It turns out Smith hates the Matrix just as much as Morpheus, yet for very different reasons. Smith views himself as above it. Agent Smith represents the elite. He's the one who creates the Matrix. He hates the people inside of it. The people inside of it are the only ones 
once feeding his life force. And yet he can't help but despise these people. These people who live in blissful ignorance of the horrible world around them. They have no idea what the truth is. They don't know the darkness of the real world. And by accessing the secrets that Morpheus holds, this will allow Agent Smith to completely destroy the last remaining bastion of humanity in the outside world, a place called Zion. But before Smith can extract this information, Neo and Trinity storm the building with multiple firearms, rescuing Morpheus in the process. The trio made their escape through a phone booth as Morpheus exits the Matrix along with Trinity, but not before witnessing Agent Smith at the last second, leaving him alone with Neo. The two begin fighting, but Neo isn't able to keep up with Smith and is eventually shot dead. Back on the ship with Morpheus and Trinity, they watch Neo as all of this happens. Devastated, Trinity whispers into Neo's ear that she would fall in love with a dead man and that he is the one. As she kisses Neo, he is thunderously resurrected, almost in a biblical sense. This scene again is just another phase of the hero's journey, the point of deepest despair. It seems like all is lost as Neo lies unconscious, but when Neo makes the choice to save Morpheus, he begins the final steps towards his journey. His death and rebirth are literal, but they're also metaphorical. Mr. Anderson, the person with no purpose, the person who's nihilistic, the person who's self-hating, self-wallowing, living an atomized, transient, lonely life in a dystopian megacity, is gone. However, Neo is born. This sequence and what follows next is the conclusion of Neo's journey, where he faces his harshest challenge yet as he journeys into the government building to rescue Morpheus. In doing so, he becomes the one. He conquers his mind, and by doing so, Neo fulfills his hero's journey. He finally finds meaning in life. Neo defeats the nihilism surrounding him by accepting the truth around the world. And from Neo's perspective, everything around him is now computer code. He effortlessly flies into Agent Smith, obliterating him and causing his colleagues to run away. Once all said and done, Neo exits the Matrix and detonates an EMP, securing the safety of his operation space back in the real world. The film then ends with Neo talking on a payphone, speaking directly to the audience. Neo sends a warning that he is going to expose the truth of what's really out there, and he proceeds to fly straight up in the sky as the film cuts to black. This end scene is an allegory of escaping nihilism. Through rejecting our fractured habitus and the false values of the virtual world, one can find meaning in reality. Among many, these consumerist forces we find today are distractions that drive people away from the truth. But with self-improvement and your own hero's journey, it's possible to escape the clutches of your own matrix. In the film, the bullets that would have killed Neo before simply stop in mid-air. In the same way, the things that seem like problems in the virtual world cease to matter when you stop focusing on them and pay attention to the real ones. This whole end scene is supposed to highlight the true power of overcoming our own mind, our own self-destructive thoughts, and our own self-limiting beliefs. By defeating his anxieties, Neo could defeat anything. It was only once he conquered himself that he could find transcendental meaning and overcome the impossible. Which is what this film is trying to show us, that when you realize that you have full control of your behavior, addictions, anxieties, relationships, health, and destiny, can you start to wake up from the delusion you've been living in? This is the only way of breaking through the matrix that has enslaved your life.